United Methodist Church. And uh, here in Potomac, it is a wind, windy, windy Good Friday. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious and almighty God, we need your wind to blow. We need the leaves to rustle around us and we need the trees to wave. And we need the skies to part on this day so that we will be drawn deeper into your spirit and deeper into the words of our Lord Jesus. It's so easy for us to run on now to Easter Sunday morning to get to talking about resurrection when we have yet to put our feet at the foot of the cross. So plant us in your rocky soil for the time it takes each of the seven of us to be reminders of your word. Bless each preacher and everyone who bears a moment to listen. We ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. So my word is the first word, and the first word comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, uh, chapter 23, verse 34. And from Luke, it reads like this, Jesus then said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine? Every year on Good Friday, I force myself as a spiritual discipline to go to Calvary, to spend some time on the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, so that I can imagine it. I've been to Jerusalem in, in uh, skin and bone, and so I've walked the Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross. And I can tell you that the first century church believed that that there were these moments when Jesus stopped along the way. What I didn't know until I walked it myself is that, that from Pilate's palace to uh, the skull is about a half a mile uphill. And it's now in the middle of the city, the cobbled road, not so much unlike what Jesus would have traveled. I didn't know it was up hill all the way. You know, that half a mile doesn't seem like very much, but they say that the beam that Jesus carried that day weighed about a hundred pounds and a hundred pounds carrying it uphill would have been a difficult journey for a healthy man. So I'm asking, can you imagine Truth be told, just last night, we remembered that they took Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane in chains. And then back and forth, he was between Pilate and Herod for difficult uh, conversation. And, and then at some point, somebody decided he needed to be reminded of what they believed was his place. And so someone took a whip uh, strips of leather, they say, with tiny animal bones uh, sewn into the end of each strap 39 times across his back. And then because bullying behavior hasn't really changed after all these years, it, it seeks to make the weak even weaker and more vulnerable. Someone decided to to take some uh, thorns from a thorn bush and tree and they wove together this crown. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus wasn't a healthy man when he made this walk from Pilate's palace uphill for half a mile to Golgotha. So they put that crown of thorns on his head and that's the guy that was carrying the cross a half a mile up hill. Orthodox tradition says that there's a woman who at one point came out of the shadows in a doorway and she <clears throat> wiped the blood from Jesus' brow. And uh, I don't know if it happened like that or not, but I like to think that on that particular day, somebody came out of the shadows to help him. 
then he walked on and and we're told that that uh that the next thing he knew he was standing in this place of crucifixion and i want to know if you can imagine that i want to know if you will allow yourself to feel the discomfort will you allow yourself on this good friday to be uncomfortable because we're meant to be uncomfortable. If we're gonna stand at the foot of the cross, we're meant to just hook our feet into the soil of reality and, and stand right here and recognize that, that, that this man went to the cross on our behalf and it wasn't fair and it was gross. And there are parts of it that we would rather turn our eyes away from it was wrong on so many levels, but this was God, God with skin on who kept walking with full knowledge and choice to be crucified. So I don't want you to ever let anybody tell you that Jesus didn't have a choice. Jesus had a choice. Every step he took, he had a choice. And, and he made the conscious decision that somehow the people who were lining the streets and the people who had tortured him and the people who were afraid to accompany him would be worth dying for, that we would be worth dying for. Can you imagine that? When he got to Golgotha, there were two thieves already there and they were being nailed down to their own cross beams and hoisted into the air. But they took more time with Jesus. We know that they hammered his wrists right and left and they hammered his feet. They re-affixed the crown of thorns. Somebody even took the time to write a sign that said King of the Jews and nail it above his head. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that from the cross there was that kind of love, that blanket of forgiveness before anyone thought to ask for it. You and me, we get all caught up in the details of forgiveness. We say somebody's got to repent a good number of times before the Lord's going to forgive them. You got to say it just right. You got to carry it to the foot of the cross. You got to lay it down at the altar. And that's what we do to forgiveness. But that's not what Jesus did with forgiveness. What Jesus did was with forgiveness was to say, Father, forgive all of them. Forgive Pilate and Herod. Forgive the guy with the whip who hurt me so bad. Forgive the crown of thorns. Forgive the crowds who didn't know what to do. Forgive Veronica for only stepping out of the shadows and stepping back in. Forgive the disciples that ran away. Forgive the few that stood at the foot of the cross. Forgive the ones who shouted for his death. Can you imagine that? There wasn't any formula. There wasn't any uh, a, a news of the way people needed to repent. It was just this incredible gift of forgiveness from the first moment he hung on the cross. That was his first word. Can you imagine? Amen.